Welcome to episode 373 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Jacob Johnston, who just wrote and directed a horror film called Dreamcatcher. He started out right out of college working as an intern at Marvel and helping manage the art, uh, the artists in the visual development of various characters and items in the Marvel movies. And then he worked his way up from there, getting a background in this. And now, as I said, he is writing and directing feature films. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. The early bird deadline is March 31st. After that, it goes up by $10, so there's just a few more days. If your script is ready, definitely submit early. We're looking for low-budget shorts and low-budget features. I'm defining low-budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than $1 million. We've got lots of industry judges reading scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. If any of this sounds interesting or you want to sign up um, and enter your script, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention on the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 373. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. Teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and career letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. I feel a little bit ridiculous saying this every week, but we really are almost done with the rideshare killer now. The editor has everything. He's putting together the final pieces. Um, I was literally finalizing the credits, the, the opening credits and the closing credits. I was finalizing that this morning. So I think we're basically done unless there's some sort of unforeseen issue down the road. And those always do crop up, whether it be some sort of a QC um, issue. Um, at some point, we'll run this through what's called a, a some sort of a quality check um, and one of these post houses here in LA will do it and you get like an official report but this is needed for distribution for any kind of like real distribution where you're going to actually get shown on like a potentially a TV broadcast network even in in another country another continent whatever um, they're going to require this QC report um, and it just checks for stuff missing drop frames that kind of stuff so there's always little things and I did have on my last film the pinch there actually was a, an issue that they that they found um, just some drop frames and we had to go back in and just um, just f finesse it a little bit. The editor had to go back in. So there is always issues, but the bottom line is we should have a, a cut of the finished film here pretty soon. And we're going to start submitting to um, distributors. We've been submitting now to film festivals here for a couple of weeks. Um, so again, all that seems to be moving forward. I'm excited to just get this finished, get it out into the world. Um, and again, hopefully we'll get into some cool festivals and find a distributor. We're trying to submit more to festivals sort of the latter half of this year. So we're really hoping COVID is is sort of a, a in our rear view mirror, certainly by, um, you know, September, October, November of, of this year. Um, so we're hoping that some of these festivals will be um, in-person events that we can attend. We've submitted, obviously, to a lot of genre festivals. We have sort of a, a um, horror thriller film. So we've submitted to those sort of genre festivals, but we've also submitted to a good number that are just here in Los Angeles, um, whether that be um, horror festivals or not. We just any kind of festivals we found in Los Angeles, we're going to submit to. Again, those will be fun um, if they do have in-person events. We'll be able to attend those, and and who knows, maybe we can um, we can get some of the the SYS listeners to to some of those events as well. Anyway, that's the main thing that I have been working on over the last week. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer director Jacob Johnston. Here is the interview. Welcome, Jacob, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Sure. So so I'm, uh, I was born in Oklahoma, but uh, we moved around a lot when I was a, a kid, first because my dad was in the military and then when he got out with his job. So 
kind of moved around quite a bit, but uh, I spend a lot of my life in Kentucky. So when people ask, I typically just say that. <laughs> um, but uh, came out here uh, to California in 2008 uh, for film school, went to Chapman University. Um, actually was able to get through college in, in two years. And uh, my first job out of film, uh, out of film school was at Marvel Studios, where I had been interning um, in animation, but then it actually, there, there opened up a spot in the live action development world, which is where I really wanted to go. Um, and, you know, 2010, the studio was still, it would, I wouldn't say small, but, but they hadn't done, you know, what it is, you know, it, it wasn't what sure. it is now. Uh, yeah. So it was, you know, a real blessing to be able to be a part of something um, that was still growing in a lot of ways. And I spent almost seven years there uh, over about 13 films um, before leaving. And uh, I had worked for this um, startup production company called Crypt TV. That was uh, um, Eli Roth and uh, Jack Davis's company. Um, and it was kind of like an incubation place where, where we would create short form content. We would find writers and filmmakers all over the world and they would finance these short form pieces of content between two and 10 minute long short films hmm. and then hopefully be able to grow those IPs, um, you know, and, and take them to studios or, or networks to sell and package. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously after I left there, it was really just focusing on, on writing and directing full time. Um, and you know, here we are with Dreamcatcher. Yeah. So let me just um, ask a couple questions, follow up questions on all of that. And um, I think that's an excellent point. As Marvel Studios took off, you know, you were able to kind of ride that wave a little bit. I'm curious about um, you have a lot of credits to say visual development coordinator and visual development producer. What does that actually mean? Like, what do you actually do on these films? And I'm kind of just curious how that ultimately is going to play into sort of your background as a writer director. But maybe you can kind of d d explain that that title to us. Absolutely. And it really started because I actually chose to make production design my emphasis in film school. Uh, Cause when you're a junior, at least at Chapman, you have to pick, you know, directing cinematography, one of the five key positions. And because there were only three other production designers in my senior class, uh, I, I found, and there were 65 directors. I looked yeah. at it and I was like, I think it's so important to know how to tell the story visually without any, you know, like I, I felt that the, the experience was translatable on a narrative level. Um, maybe I'm not going to direct, you know, a thesis film, but I can still work on five or six thesis films as a production designer, really glean a lot of experience, onset experience. And I think, you know, if you look throughout time, if, if you're looking at trans translatable jobs uh, in, in this industry, it's like Robert Eggers, uh, Captain Hardwick, Joe Johnston, these people who were art directors or production designers who turned directors. I think mm -hmm. it happens more often than not, you know, maybe, maybe cinematographers too, but I do believe that you see a lot of, you know, production designers moving into that direction. So going into, you know, Marvel, they were creating a new team uh, that was going to be conceptualizing in-house all of the, all of the key characters, a lot of the key props or like what we would consider like iconic, uh, like comic, what, what things from the comics that would need to be translated into mm -hmm. film um, this team was going to be conceptualing all of that. And it was like three people when I first started. And by the time I left, it was like 17 to 18. And now I know they've grown even more, but hmm. I was, when I was a coordinator, it was just like the normal, you know, coordinating duties, ensuring that things got done, got finished on time and like managing phone calls and calendars and all that stuff. But when it became into a more producerial role, it was being in all of the development meetings with all the other key crew members. It was being in conversations with the writer and the director and, going to costume fittings and like it, it really was about hoping, helping to um, maintain and create this uh, shared visual language throughout all the films. Um, Cause when you're, when you're creating this shared universe, it's really important to create some sort of continuity between them. So our department at all points knew what was going on in every single movie. So we were kind of one step ahead um, to, to ensure that like, Oh, we got to create a new Iron Man suit. And it's got to do this, this, and this. Let's start thinking about it now. Um, yeah. Or like, what is what is magic in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Creating that. Like, what does that look like? Um, hmm. How does Ant-Man shrink and grow? Like, things like that, where it was like, we had to figure out the mechanics as well as the design elements. Gotcha, um, gotcha. 
I'm curious too about something you said, um, which I think is another excellent point. Um, you went into the production design. There was only three production designer majors and there was 65 directing majors. How many of those 65 directing majors are directing feature films now? And I think obviously there might be some, but certainly of, yeah. you know, you, what are your odds actually better? You know, one out of three of these production designers is, is directing features and how many of these 65? And I always think it's interesting when people recognize it, sometimes taking a little side sidestep is actually the, the best way forward a hundred percent i think it's you know i think that for the thing too though is in film school they try to ingrain i think this mentality that it's like if you don't go this path then it doesn't happen and i think if, if hollywood shows us anything it's that like like what you were saying sometimes you have to sidestep multiple times um and as long as you've got the wherewithal and you don't lose the creative vision of what you want to do it doesn't really matter how you get there you know, as long as you're not going to lose the steam along the way um, and just continue to you know, sh stretch that muscle, that creative muscle, whether that's in, you know, art direction, whether that's in directing what you know, if it's music videos, if it's short films, just make sure that you're not just like hoping that one day someone's going to knock on your door. And be like It's time to go direct a movie. Hope you're ready. You know. Yeah, yeah. And the value of that thesis film, I totally agree with you. You're probably better off because then when you have 65 directors, that's 65 films that you potentially have you can go work on as a production designer, as opposed to having that one thesis film, which may or may not even be all that good. Absolutely. So let's dig into Dreamcatcher. Um, again, as some fantastic points. I hope people are really listening. But let's dig into Dreamcatcher and, and um, talk about that a little bit. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick picture log on what is this film all about? Uh, the film's about two estranged sisters who kind of come back together um, after three years and uh, end up going to this underground music festival and uh, some some bad stuff goes down and it kind of trickles out into this uh, two-day maelstrom of uh, of emotional chaos and then also physical violence. So it's I, I have to be kind of careful. It's, it's tough. It's a tough pitch because it, I think it would be easy to just go, oh, it's a slasher film. But I hope that when people see the film... They're like, wow, no, this is this has got more of like a Saint Elmo's fire meets scream. You know, like you've got the huh. character development, but you've also got kind of a the fun, thrilling set pieces of a mm -hmm. slasher. Gotcha, gotcha. And where did this idea come from? What is the sort of the genesis of this story? So I knew the producers, Brandon and Crystal, for for about five or six years, and we had had this this shared love for '90s, you know, horror and thriller type stories because those had a very specific structure in their writing. Uh, like if you look back at the 90s, even late 80s, um, th there was something really innovative and beautiful. And, and maybe it started to get repetitious after a while because it was just like everybody copying the same formula. But every now and then you've got these ones that kind of like broke out. But what was so great about it was, you know, you've got these, these reprieves of character development throughout. And it wasn't just like death scene to death scene to death scene. So I knew them for a while. I knew we had a shared taste. And they had called me kind of out of the blue and they were like, Hey, we have the financing to make a film. Um, we want to do kind of a love letter to the nineties. We want it to be an ensemble piece and uh, we'd love for it to deal with music in some way. And those were kind of the parameters. Hmm. And then they just let me go play in this like sandbox of, of creativity uh, to conceptualize the story. And how did you meet Brandon and Crystal? Uh, we met in a backyard uh, at a barbecue back in 2015 and uh, they were coming off producing a film with Wes Craven. Um, and so that's kind of how the conversation about 90s genre fair got started. And hmm. uh, we just, it was just kind of like one of those, yeah, we have mutual interests and uh, they're great people. So Gotcha. And how do you pitch yourself? I mean, obviously now um, you have a lot of experience in this visual um producing but how do you convince people um on imdb it looks like you had done one short where you had written and directed it but how do you convince these folks you meet them in a backyard barbecue you just strike up a converse conversation how do you convince them that you know you're capable of of taking all this money and and turning it into something that's actually worth you know doing i think it's passion i honestly believe that like it's no different than when you go pitch at a studio if, if the passion is there, I mean, yes, you have to make sure you have the technical ability to, to do and, and perform the actual you know, execution of, of making one of these movies. But I do believe that if you can convince somebody that you understand this world, that you understand how to, how to create a character, how you under, like the, the ability to speak to somebody's psyche, uh, it's more important than trying to pitch some, some plot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a great example is when we were doing guardians of the galaxy um we were looking they, they went on a big director search 
and we brought in all these different people and, you know, heard their pitches and stuff. And when James Gunn came in, you know, he was very casual, cup of coffee. And he's like, I want to talk to you about the characters. I want to talk to you about the guardians. And it's like, that's what it's all about. It's, it's not trying to sell this, this huge fantasy that's, you know, maybe disconnected or, 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 you know, doesn't all add up. It's really, if you can distill the story down, you can be passionate about it and people just it contagious mm-hmm. that that's how I think you can convince somebody. Um, and you're going to get a lot of passes. Like I, I did probably 35 music videos besides that short film, you know, to build a reel of, of content, but it's like, you know, and you can show that great. You know how to work with a you know cinematographer, you know, this stuff, but it's really, I think how you talk to people and trying to appeal to their sense of storytelling as well and mm-hmm. finding a mutual connection. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's dig into um, to Dreamcatcher and the writing of the script. Um, what is your writing process like? Um, do you typically write at home? Do you have a home office? Um, and when do you typically write? Are you a morning person, night person? What does your writing schedule look like? I, I love uh, getting started in the morning. Um, there's just something about the energy of, of waking up and really wanting to dive into something and using the first couple hours as an exploratory period. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't typically, unless it's like a, a specific, like we need you to do a treatment. I don't typically do just like an outline or a treatment. I really just dive in. Um, and I start writing scenes and trying to figure out the character voices. Um, and once I've kind of got the voices of the characters down, I kind of backpedal and, and try to find out who they are that way. And then I go rework the scenes because I, I, I find in my own process that if I'm too locked into an outline or I'm too, I, I overthink the whole structure of the script. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's good to have a broad strokes understanding of plot mechanics, but as far as the actual like narrative drive and, and kind of scene to scene, I like to explore it organically. Um, and it can take a little longer, but I think at the same time, what you end up with is something where it doesn't feel contrived. It mm-hmm. kind of feels in this, in this world where it's like, no, this has got a good flow to it. And you've really taken the care uh, and consideration and making sure that your, your characters feel fleshed out. Yeah. Um, Cause I do believe you, you get a lot of notes like that. You mentioned that you do, you don't do a lot of outlining and then you go and you do a dra- you just start writing scenes and eventually it starts to, to form itself. How much of that early writing ends up in the final script? And I'm really just kind of curious to hear like, what are those scenes in that dialogue? What are those actually like and how much do they ultimately pertain um, to it? Or is that just sort of your process of working through the characters and the dialogue and that sort of stuff? I think it's about half and half. I think that there's, you know, uh, there's some because the conversations are typically still about like plot points you know it's not kind of like a casual conversation i try to weave in here's what i need to move the story forward um so i would say it's, it's probably a 50 50 maybe 75 25 in, in certain you know it depends on the genre like in something that's uh, i don't you know if i'm writing a period piece sure it's going to take a little longer because i got to make sure the syntax and all of that is is right but if it's you know something that's a little more modern and and a little less high stakes, I think you can probably say about 50-50. Gotcha, gotcha. And I'm curious, just as ter- in terms of your development process, it sounds like Brandon and Crystal, they showed up, they basically had financing in place, and then you start writing this draft. Um, how did that development process work? Um, were there ever moments where um, maybe Brandon and Crystal had other ideas? And how do you work through those types of things, just you know, when people have differences opinion of opinion? It, it, it happened more, I think, in, in the actual execution of the film. There was a lot of questions in terms of like, well, why are we doing it this way? Or, hmm. or why is this person standing here? And and on the screenplay level, it was it was a lot of trust, which, to be honest, uh, you don't get a whole lot, <laughs> especially mm-hmm. if you get more. You know, we were in a fortunate position where we only had two producers and one exec. So I only had to really answer to three people. And typically, you know, in a bigger film or, or even like a bigger indie film, you have to answer to nine or ten people. It becomes tough because Mm -hmm. like everybody wants something different and you have to stick to your guns in terms of knowing the story but you know where you're willing to make concessions i I do think it's you know you can't go in knowing that the movie is going to be exactly you know what it is in your head because someone's always going to have an opinion and it might make the the story better but but thankfully in Dreamcatcher, i wrote the first draft in nine days Hmm. and then we spent about a month and a half doing just punch-ups and changes but but it was more of a collaborative environment it was more like because we had a shared taste and a mutual understanding of what we needed and wanted the story to be, it was kind of like 
best idea wins, you mm-hmm. know, where it's like, hey, what if we tried it this way? Or, hey, what if we did this? And to me, that makes the, the rewrite process way more exciting and accessible mm-hmm. yeah. because you're, you're excited to dive back into the material. You know, you don't feel chained to it. You're kind of like, yeah, let's explore that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but mm-hmm. you know, it's still a great exploratory period. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely the right attitude. Um, how can people see Dreamcatcher? Do you know what the, um, do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yeah. So, so U S and in Canada is March 5th. Uh, that's going to be VOD. Okay. And I think drive-ins some places, um, but it'll be on every VOD platform. And um, I don't know the international rollout plan, but but yeah, March 5th for, for domestic. Gotcha. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll round up for the show notes. Yeah, I, I, I have all of those things, but really the only thing I'm, I'm active on is Twitter. Um, and that's just Jake underscore squared. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, Jacob, I really appreciate you coming on the show with me. Um, good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Ben Housie, who just wrote and directed a film called Private Chat, spelled PVT Chat. It's about a guy who becomes obsessed with a cam girl and then runs into her and meets her, and it's that sort of a story. He's a New York filmmaker, and he is, um, comes on next week to tell us about his career, how he got into the business, worked his way up, and now is making feature films. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.